Okay, Chair, we're streaming live on YouTube, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, good afternoon and welcome to East Devon District Council's Virtual Consultative Arts and Culture Forum meeting on the 12th of October 2022. I'm your Chair, Councillor Joe Wibley, and I'd also like to welcome anyone watching the meeting via live streaming. I'd like to remind both members and anybody else attending or watching that the Council's delegated much of its decision-taking power to our senior officers until the 31st of October 2022. And this is due to concerns relating to COVID risk. Consequently, this meeting is being held on a consultative basis only, but we'll continue to adhere as closely as possible to the procedural rules detailed in our constitution. The meeting can be viewed live online and will be recorded. And please bear this in mind throughout the recording. So may I remind colleagues to be careful with their language and that the code of conduct applies throughout our meeting. We reserve the right to remove and disconnect any participant disrupting the meeting by whatever means. So if you can make sure your telephone devices are off or on silent. As this consultative arts and culture meeting is dependent on internet connection and a power supply in the event of a break in the internet connection or power cut, please bear with us as we try to reconnect. After 15 minutes, if we're not able to reconnect, we'll consider the meeting adjourned and reconvene at a later date. Please check the committee page on our website for details. Can you make sure all your microphones are muted when you're not speaking to avoid any background noise levels? If you could keep your points short and do not repeat, point, repeat points that have already been made and do not interrupt. And if you wish to comment, please raise your electronic hand and wait to be called. Um, all councillors have, councillors have been sent the agenda for today's meeting. Um, any members of the public who wish to view the agenda can do so by visiting the website www.eastdevon.gov.uk. We will now start the meeting by doing a roll call of committee members here present. Can you please now unmute your microphone and when you hear your name, please confirm by saying present. When you've confirmed you are present, please mute your microphone again. Um, Sarah. Thank you. So we'll start with yourself, please. So, Councillor Wibley. I am present. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Present. Present. Thank you. Councillor Borough. Uh, Councillor Borough, not present, but I'm representing Axminster Town Council. Jill Farrow, Chair of Axminster Town Council. Thank you, Jill. Councillor Buchan, please. He sent his apologies, Sarah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cole, please. Councillor Davy. Councillor Desarren. Councillor Hookway. Present, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Councillor Moulding. Present. Thank you. Councillor Rylance. Councillor Tate. Present. Thank you. Councillor Whips. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And Brian Norris, please. Okay, thank you. I'll pass back to you, Chair. I can confirm that we are caught. Thank you. You're on mute, Chair. Didn't take long, did it? Oh. Okay. Agenda item one is public speaking. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I don't think there's any public speakers here today. Um, yeah, we have no public speakers, Chair, none. Okay, thank you. So agenda item two is the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, so if anybody has a comment on the set of minutes from the 15th of June, um, could you raise your electronic hands? But otherwise, I'll um, take it as an indication that we are happy the minutes are accepted. Okay, I see no hands. So those minutes have been accepted. Um, agenda item three is apologies. Um, we have two, I believe, so far. Um, uh, yes, so we have apologies from Councillor Johns, Councillor Stephen, um, as well as Councillor Buchan and Councillor Boa. Okay, thank you very much. So agenda item four is declarations of interest, uh, which will be done by roll call. Um, so when your name is called, um, Please be mindful of the new code of conduct and state your declaration 
including which agenda item your declaration relates to, state what exactly the interest is and the specific type of interest you're declaring, Sarah. Thank you. So yourself, please, Councillor Wibley. Um, none that I can see at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Brown, please. Not that I can see at the moment, unless the beehive's mentioned. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hookway. None, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Councillor Moulding. Um, yes, I'm um, a trustee of Axminster Heritage Limited and a trustee of Axminster Musical Theatre. So I guess that might come into the realm of the culture strategy, item 10. And I think it's an effects NRI. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Moulding. Councillor Tate, please. Done, thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Whips. Uh, none. Thank you very much. And are there any other councillors in the meeting who want to declare an interest that might affect your ability to remain in the meeting? No, just to say that I'm here now. I apologise for being late. My uh, laptop was on a bit of a go slow um, and I have no interest to declare. Lovely. Thank you, Councillor Davey. I'll pass back to you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Um, so now we move to um, agenda item five, um, an update from uh, Villages in Action. Um, so I'd like to welcome, is it Mayor George? Mayor George, hello. Mayor George, who's the programme manager for Villages in Action. Um, I have some notes here that Charlie's, Charlie, some little bullet points that Charlie's given me. Um, so forum members will be aware that we're, um, that we're still a very important supporter and funder of uh, their work. And it's heartening to know that despite the impacts of COVID and the cancellation of and, and loss of vital income, that lots of events have still, have, have still taken place and, and there are exciting recovery plans. Good work, Charlie. Um, so I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I sent a presentation. Is it possible to have that shared with the group on screen? Or do um, sorry, should I share I'm that? I'm sorry. What, yes, I can make you um, co-host, and then if you're happy to share it yeah. yourself, is that okay? Absolutely, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, no problem. Um, Whilst that's going on, just chair, sorry to interject. Um, I hadn't appreciated that Alethea was going to be at the meeting, and I know a couple of people are just checking presentations gone through we've we got the full set Sarah do you know um I'm sorry Charlie I don't know um I don't have them I'm afraid um so if they've um, gone to Alethea sorry Sarah Charlie I've got something let me just um right it, it would be just a case to give those um a bit of a heads up so if you make Ruth a co-host and I guess Ray a co-host from Libraries Unlimited um, and, and Anna Fitzgerald. And Anna Fitzgerald. Um, sorry for that. Thanks, Chair. Just uh, more. Yeah, um, no worries. Sure run, run smoothly and everybody doesn't have a kind of an IT panic when we get to that moment. No worries at all. Um, Thank you. So that is now being shared. We, we can see the Villages in Action screen. Fantastic. Thank you very much. OK, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mara George. Uh, and uh, as, as has been said, I am the programme manager for Villages in Action. So for those of you who might not be aware or familiar with the organisation, we are a charity that works across Devon's rural towns and villages. And our core purpose is to enable and promote engagement in the arts in all its forms. Uh, we aim to empower communities to develop, organise and sustain their own cultural activity, enhancing the quality of life social inclusion, self-confidence and enterprise. Our ongoing work enables communi community participation in the arts through activating, presenting creative work at grassroots level, building a network of people who engage and identify as artists, art enablers and supporters. A very quick re rewind to 2020 when uh, I last presented to the forum. Um, we were very optimistic, obviously looking forward, uh, continuing to build momentum uh, in Devon as part of the Locomotive Project, uh, headed up by Carnter Cove, the rural touring scheme in Cornwall. Uh, obviously we all know what happened in March, 2020. 
um, making what we do uh, or what we did uh, in village halls, which is present uh, live performances in village halls, impossible. So we have had to be flexible in our approach uh, and we've had to adapt. Check I can move to the next slide. Sorry, bear with me. Technology is always the, always the one. Here we are. Okay. Uh, so on this slide, you will see some examples of outdoor work that we hosted in the summers of 2020 and 2021. Uh, we hosted a mobile library tour with Exmouth Library, uh, where we presented a, a children's piece of work that's in the top right hand corner. Uh, local, art, local East Devon uh, based artist Boo to a Goose presented their work in Woodbury and in Cranbrook. Uh, you'll see some other outdoor uh, performances, uh, including Hero and Leander in Orliscombe, uh, Gig Theatre, uh, that, that, that was Gig Theatre, uh, presented by local artist Jack Dean and company. You can see some images there of a green alien and a field, uh, and that was Miracle Theatre uh, on Goran Farm. Um, and we also hosted international circus performances and parkour workshops with Said Musim. That was for young people aged 10 to 18. Um, also workshops around gods, myths and monsters with Jonathan Hayter. We hosted a residency with Running Dog Theatre uh, and we presented circus at the Honiton Show with Pirate Taxi with over 350 people uh, watching that live performance, as well as hosting numerous digital sharings, creative writing sessions and more. So uh, headlines since we last met. In January 2022, we received a significant project grant from Arts Council England uh, to bring the management of the activity back to Devon and to re-establish villages in action and to pilot new ways of working. Along with that funding, we have a renewed board that brings artists, promoters, arts professionals with a wide range of experience and insights to the work that we do. You can see a lovely Zoom picture there of us. Uh, and we have also established a team of Devon-based workers with myself, Luke, uh, Sophie and Rachel that you can see in the pictures, uh, and we regularly employ freelance artists on a regular basis to engage with us on specific projects. We are now at a pivotal moment in our development, looking to the future to ensure the long-term sustainability of community-led artistic activities in rural Devon. In December 2022, we will be launching our new business plan that will set out how Villages in Action will achieve our new vision and mission. Our vision is for every community to be creative. Our mission is to support people to curate their own cultural, creative and artistic activities. So these are the facts and figures so far uh, this year. So as you'll see, um, a lot has happened uh, in, in since January, uh, establishing a team uh, and so on. We have earned so far this year £5,716 across our live activities programme, with 2,568 of that being in East Devon. We've had audiences of uh, effectively performances began again. We started doing very tentative things uh, in kind of April and May. So really, we're just talking about the last three to four months. We've had 816 people attend our performances and 393 of those have been in East Devon. We've hosted 16 events and five of those uh, have been in East Devon. Uh, some of the performances that we have hosted this year, uh, Homelands by the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra, as you can see that took place in the Beehive Honiton. I believe we had 99 people uh, in attendance uh, at that event and that took place just 10 days ago, um, a really successful event uh, and, and we were delighted to welcome the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra to East Devon. Uh, they're hoping to return in spring next year um, as part of a new partnership uh, with, with a promoter in Ottery St Mary, so we'll be delighted to, to welcome them back. This took place just last weekend. So this was an event called uh, The Goat Show by Running Dog Theatre. You can see an array of, of pictures there. Um, we had 93 people in attendance in the audience. You can see in the bottom right hand picture, or maybe it's the other way around for you. Sorry, I won't uh, specify which one, but you can see the, the hall there uh, with a packed audience. And um, this was a new way of touring. So we've been partnering with Running Dog Theatre, uh, who are a CIC based in Exeter. 
Uh, last year, we hosted them during a residency in Stockland in East Devon, where they were developing their work, uh, developing this show uh, in residence in communities. That's a really strong part of the work that we like to create, um, not just bringing uh, performances uh, to villages and uh, and other venues for audiences to enjoy, but involve our 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 local residents are involved in the co-creation of, of that activity. Uh, so it was really lovely for Running Dog Theatre to return to us last weekend, to return to Stockland, to the Victory Hall, and um, present their work. This new kind of uh, touring um, involves participation sort of all along the way. So the artists arrive on Wednesday evening where they got involved in the local pub quiz uh, at the uh, community pub in the King's Arms in, in Stockland. Um, so that was a chance, basically what happened was uh, Josh, who's one of the lead artists at Running Dog Theatre, hosted a couple of rounds about goats specifically as part of the pub quiz, but also the local pub quiz master had really got into the um, uh, into, into the whole thing and had added a question about goats into each uh, into each round uh, of, of the pub quiz. Um, you can see the um, uh, residents were asked to create their own goats, decorate their own goats, and uh, the very happy, smiley um, staff at the pub uh, were asked to judge the best one. You can see goat cookies uh, and the goat pen. So all of those who uh, had made goats um, brought their goats along to the performance on Sunday. Um, that was on Wednesday. On Friday, Running Dog hosted a workshop uh, at Stockland Academy at the primary school. Um, and again, what we found, it was really interesting watching the, the, the kind of ticket sales. After each of those participatory activities, those um, opportunities for the local community to get involved, ticket sales spiked. So um, we're testing this new way of, of touring um, that's kind of a little bit more involved and involves the community much more. We have, so as part of our From Devon with Love Festival, um, we hosted an event uh, jointly with the Axminster Heritage Centre. That's the first time that we prevent, presented something at the Heritage Centre. And this was a piece called Make Room. Uh, so it's, uh, again, a group of local flautists uh, called Flute Cake. Um, and they present, there's different music that has been written uh, for each room. Um, or, or a room so for example uh, one of the titles was uh, big room hard surfaces so what their aim then uh, each time they enter a new space to perform the piece they have to make the pieces match into those rooms it was a really interesting way of getting audiences to wander around the heritage center and to experience it in a new way our From Devon with Love programme is something that we've launched since we last spoke or since we last met. Um, it's our artist development initiative. Uh, some of you might recognise the name. So it was a festival that was launched by the Bike Shed Theatre in Exeter. Much loved, much missed. Um, but we delighted to relaunch the festival last year. Uh, so we had a... Um, uh, in memory, we hosted uh, an evening. So the, the event is essentially uh, scratch. So work in progress, a chance for local artists to engage in creative conversations uh, with, uh, with local communities and local residents. Um, so as part of that, audiences are invited to give feedback very directly to, to the artists, uh, which will then uh, contribute to the ongoing development uh, of that work. This was a production uh, called Do What Your Mama Told You by Just More Productions. Um, they're a Bristol based company, um, mother and daughter, uh, who presented this fantastic circus show for families, uh, which was all around um, uh, understanding where food comes from, uh, but done in a really fun and playful way. Um, we had fantastic audiences, but this is us experimenting with outdoor theatre, something that perhaps we hadn't done a lot, a lot of before, but it, COVID provided new opportunities uh, for us to experiment with uh, working in different spaces. Um, and this was a fantastic space in, in Stockland. Somebody opened up their, their garden, uh, which was fantastic. And we were able to bring uh, the circus show uh, to everybody uh, in the village. This is just a, a small a slide about what our uh, audiences are saying. Uh, I'll just read a couple. It was remarkable. So these are after events. I hope you go from strength to spend, strength to strength to support arts in rural Devon. It's so important that we have work like this in our villages from a multicultural progressive UK. 
people really enjoy being able to see high quality artistic work in their own localities, uh, in intimate settings, and we want to make sure that that can continue. We're really interested in involving more members of the community. Um, so we're excited to be back in village halls. Um, we've done a couple of performances recently in the village halls, but it's been really interesting for us to experiment um, and to see if there's an appetite uh, for outdoor work, for example, um, co-created work, um, work that um, involves residents uh, in, in a different way in the creation uh, of the work. We also hosted a research and development for a local uh, company called Bumnote, who again are based in Exeter, um, with their piece called Armageddon Attenborough. Uh, so this is all around uh, climate change. Um, but one of the things that we found with live performance that deals with um, that deals with the very kind of existential, you know, threats is that it, it's quite it can be quite inaccessible. Um, so what's great about this piece? We supported it last year as part of our From Devon with Love Festival, where they were able to to scratch the work in front of audiences and audiences were in hysterics they have um, quite an irreverent view um, of, of things um, and create characters that we can fall in love with they completed a residency this year at the beehive in honiton who's a really important partner for us at villages in action and um, they hosted them for a week long uh, a week-long session. So this is Chris White and Hal Kelly. Um, during their week at the Beehive in Honiton, they rehearsed and developed their new comedy musical, Armageddon Attenborough. The completed show, completed show is scheduled to return next year uh, to Honiton for a preview performance um, with plans to take the production to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in the summer. The week-long residency in Honiton ended with a creative writing workshop for local residents. So that's what we've been up to uh, over the last uh, seven or eight months. Uh, and coming up, you can just see some of the performances that will be taking place specifically in East Devon over the next few months. So I think in summary, I'm not gonna go on uh, too much more, but in summary, I just want to say, um, it has been a, a tricky few years. It's been a difficult few years uh, with, with, as you all know, the, the whole industry being affected by, um, by what's going on in society. But we're really proud that despite those difficulties, we have proven to art, not only Arts Council, um, but to other funders um, that we are, um, we are here for the long term. Um, we've proven that the desire and that the need is there from audiences and residents living rurally. We, need, we now need to prove to these funders uh, to secure our future sustainability. We're excited about the future. We are recruiting new board members and we're increasing our numbers of venues that we and promoters um, and partnerships uh, that we want to engage with. We would gratefully receive any introductions um, that any of you might want to make, any direct introductions. Thank you to you all for being a district council that believes in the arts uh, and is willing to invest uh, and in supporting our mission for every community in East Devon to be creative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's really, really interesting um, and good to see that it's um, that, that, that you found ways of getting through. Um, do we have any questions? We'll take questions from anybody. There's no recommendations. We'll just take questions from anybody present um, rather than any particular order. Uh, Councillor Andrew Moulding. Andrew. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, really, just to say that um, I was delighted to attend the um, performance of Flute Cake at the Axminster Heritage Centre. Uh, I must obviously, therefore, declare an interest. I didn't realise this was going to be highlighted in this um, presentation. So if I could declare an interest on uh, item five, and that's an ORI, and... Um, the, the huge benefit of, um, of the performance of Flute Cake at the Axminster Heritage Centre was that a number of people attended. They wanted to hear Flute Cake, but at the same time, for many, it was the first time they'd visited Axminster Heritage Centre. So they were come, able to come along, walk around all the Heritage Centre rooms. Um, the flautists would be in a room. They'd be moving around. They made the thing very interesting. And so it was a, a real double whammy of listening to uh, three marvellous flautists and at the same time, uh, giving them the opportunity of looking at Axminster Heritage Centre. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moulding. Um, do we have any further questions to um, to Villages in Action? Uh, Charlie. Quick one, Chair. Just picking up the point made by Maya on um, uh, suggestions for venues. What's the... Okay. For, I presume for the rest of this year, but going into next year as well. Beetling around. Um, I was a bit of feedback going on. Um, yeah, yeah just uh, is that you, uh, Chair? Yeah. No, well, no, it wasn't me this time. Oh, wasn't it? Someone's trying to disrupt it, my uh, train of thought, um, but they haven't succeeded. Okay. So, in terms of getting those suggestions to to Myra and villages in action, what's what capacity is there in terms of taking on? new venues so just to manage expectations and um in terms of selecting what they can put on and the sort of genre of um, performance what can you just say a little bit more about um what the process is for that as well absolutely so um in terms of capacity um so we, we spent a, a, a sort of a few months at the start of this year setting up a new uh, event management system. Uh, we use something called Eventatron. So that has really streamlined quite a lot of the systems um, that, that we had before. It's sort of very just email based email emails kind of back and forth. Uh, we're still available. Of course we are. But a lot of this for people who are um, who are who are confident online they're able to submit bookings now through that system so our, cap our capacity has uh, has increased um, we we don't have a blanket policy for how we support uh, venues we do it on a case-by-case -case basis so what I would say is if there are any venues who do want to work with us to please uh, reach out um, I, I will put my email address uh, in in the chat um, uh, and, and, and anyone can reach out to us directly. Um, in terms of selection, so the way it works for us is we've moved to a slightly different model than, than we used to work on. It used to be two seasons a year. We would produce a menu and share that uh, with our promoters who would then very often, they were members of the local village hall committees. They would take that back to the committee, have a discussion, then come back to us to say, this is what we'd like to program. And, and this, these are the dates that we're, we're looking at. Um, that menu is really varied. We've got all sorts on there. So music does tend to be our most popular uh, genre, um, but we have theatre, uh, circus, uh, as I've highlighted, storytelling, puppetry, um, all sorts. And there's nothing, you know, there's no live performance really that we won't consider. So we put this menu together, but um, instead of having two seasons a year, we now have a rolling menu. Um, so there are always, probably every two weeks, there are new acts uh, being um, updated, being added to the menu. Um, so what we find is that, you know, a lot of the reluctance has been around, oh, well, maybe we won't fit into your particular season. You know, as you all know, I don't need to go into this, but, um, you know, there's been there's been a lot of shifts in, in, in kind of how volunteers are working, how village hall committees are working. Uh, a lot of people have stepped down and kind of used those opportunities to, to do something else. So um, there's been there's been new people joining, uh, you know, joining the committees and wanting to get involved with villages in action. Um, we will engage with 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 anyone, really, uh, with anyone who um, who is a resident uh, in in a rural area in Devon and wants to make something uh, fantastic happen. Um, so we're not limited by capacity we will make um, a bespoke you know kind of offer really in terms of the kind of financial subsidy and that sort of thing based on a number of factors including geography so for example um, due to the funding that we get from East Devon District Council we are able, able to offer a higher level of subsidy uh, to venues in East Devon so yeah uh, that's probably enough uh, babbling from me um, but yeah please do get in touch we'd love to hear from from anybody. That's really useful thank you. Um, do we have any uh, further questions at all? Okay, uh, Maya, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Um, so we now move to oh, we now move to the South West Museums Partnership Program uh, for the following year, and we welcome Victoria Harding, who's the Program Manager for the South West Museums Partnership, who will be bringing us up today. And it's interesting to hear. Um, my talking about um, volunteers and how how we rely on those in a lot of these these things and um, and museums do too. So um, uh, Victoria, are you here? Thank you so much. I am here. Yes, I'll just screen share for a moment. Make sure that works. Okay. Yep, that seems to be work. Yep, that's fine. Great. I'll just start at the beginning and hope that works. 
Great. Yeah, Jack, looks good. That all, and you can all hear me clearly? Great. Thank you so much. Well, firstly, thank you so much for the invitation to join the meeting this afternoon. And my name is Vic Harding, as um, has been mentioned, I'm the programme manager for Southwest Museum Development. And I'm just gonna talk through a little bit about what we've been up to and how we've been delivering support services for museums across um, the region, Devon and East Devon. So as I always do, before I give um, any more information about us as a programme, I'd like to just share a little bit of contextual information about museums in the region, particularly because we are so distinct to museums across the rest of England. So I realise that this slide might have information that is quite small if you're already looking on a, on a, on a small screen or a laptop. Um, but just to highlight that the majority of the museums in the region are independent charities. So, so they receive little, if any, public subsidy. What's really distinct about museums in our region is they tend to be what we would call micro. So that means they have fewer than 10,000 visits each year. And a really important point to emphasize, um, as Mayor has pointed out, is our reliance on volunteers and that volunteer capacity. So you can see the distinction here, 42% of museums in the region are volunteer run in comparison to 30% nationally. So that's a really big difference in the way that museums in our region operate. And then slightly related to that is in terms of their operational scale. So 38% of museums operate at fewer or less than 50,000 50, um, 50, in terms of their turnover. So they're small businesses as well as being small organizations in terms of their visit numbers. And as I mentioned some of these statistics, I think it's important to point out that the data source is the annual museum survey. So at the moment I'm looking at data 20 to 21 and in a month's time we'll be launching the 2022 data. The reason that that's going to be really important and especially interesting is because it will show us the insights to recovery. So we'll have data from 2020, which is effectively pre-pandemic, to 2020, 2021, and then how we are as a sector recovering and how we're rebuilding following the impact of the pandemic. So just a little bit, just very briefly about what museum development is and what we do. So we're a team of museum and heritage development specialists, which means we work directly with the museum and heritage sector in the south of west of England to support them, be resilient and for their development. We're co funded by Arts Council England, and we have been since 2018 a national portfolio organisation. And as I mentioned, we're the South West and there's one of us in each of the English regions. So one in each um, region across England. In terms of what we actually do and what we deliver, um, we have a team of development specialists in each of these four areas. So collections development, digital engagement, sustainable volunteering and audience development. And the reason that we focus on these four areas is because those are the four priority areas that museums express to us they consider were most important for their sustainable development. Um, I know that many um, people might recognize who work in museums um, and engage in museums in this group, um, particularly our collections development officer, Helena, who goes out and is also a qualified conservator, so providing really practical advice and support to museums. We also are the primary training provider for museums in the, for the sector in the region, and we regularly train between five and 900 people each year. And because we have so many volunteers, very often that involves a high number of volunteer delegates, as much as it would involve paid staff engaging in our training. A key part of what we do is we deliver a small grant program, and that's especially important because we ensure it's really accessible and really available to museums to, to um, access small grants, by which I mean grants less than £10,000. We do this because it can be a really powerful way in which museums can test new models of working or understand what new developments might look like for their particular context. We also provide something called a technical accreditation service. This refers to the UK's museum accreditation standard. That is the national minimum standard for museums in the UK. So we provide advice to organisations who are looking to become accredited, but we also provide technical advice and support for those museums who want to stay accredited and maintain those standards. And then finally, a really big part of our work is, um, is really going out to funders and pulling, pulling down funding to support projects with cohorts of museums. So sometimes it can be really effective and efficient 
for us to be the grant beneficiary and then distribute those funds directly to museums, particularly in support of capacity building. One of the key strengths that we have with Southwest Museum Development that is unlike the museum development providers across the rest of England is we have the benefit of local museum development officers. So what this map shows you is really the one museum development officer in each of the counties. The reason that I've highlighted the Devon County in this pink rather than the yellow is because many of you will know um, a long standing member of our team, Susan Eddisford, who was MDO for many, many years, retired. And so we've been going through a process of recruiting a new MDO for Devon. And I'm really delighted to say after several months of going through that process, Joanna will be joining us next month. She joins us from the National Trust and she has a really strong track record of supporting development in heritage organizations and museums, but really fabulously, she also comes from Cornwall and Devon. So she's got a really solid understanding about the geography, which I know is so important. So in terms of what we as a program have been doing and delivering in terms of targeted support, both to support organizations during COVID, but particularly and very importantly, in terms of their recovery and bounce back from that particular period, I've just highlighted really four key areas that we've supported organisations. So the first is around increased guidance and navigation for support. As we might all realise, over that period, a lot changed. So, for example, usual funders changed their criteria. A lot of operational things changed. So, for example, introducing, say, for example, cashless payments, new ticketing opportunities. So a lot of the support that we provided was making sure that we could help museums to navigate those opportunities, but also making sure they knew what really relevant support would be. So the relevance of that offer was a really key thing for us in supporting organisations. We also worked closely with those organisations, not just to know where there might be funding opportunities, but to really to provide extra capacity to help them to develop grant applications and develop successful investment, because we all know how much capacity it does actually take to develop and submit and receive grant funding. The other thing that we were very proud of is the work that we did thanks to the investment with Art Fund. So Art Fund were incredibly generous and actually made a cash allocation to Museum Development England to double our grant budget. And this was really powerful because it went, went we had more money and we could reach more museums at a really critical point of need. Many of the museum organisations had really good and important ideas they needed to implement, but actually access to funding was about the speed with which they could access funding and do that in a way that really met their capacity um, at that time. The other element that I wanted to highlight was really, um, like we've just heard really, the real importance about adapting to the environment we were working in. So we changed what was predominantly our in-person training to online workshops. I'm going to call it online workshops rather than online training. This was definitely not about broadcasting, but this was about supporting connections and providing specialist targeted advice and training opportunities to organisations during this really important time. So we saw our delegates jump right to up to almost a thousand, which is a really good acknowledgement of how useful and um, valuable that training offer was. And we've seen those numbers sustain over the last year, which is really good as well. We have returned to in-person training, but now we're looking at more of a mix and a blend between the two. I think it's really um, important to mention that a lot has been learnt by moving to online training. So the availability of volunteers to spend less time travelling, but actually focus that time on actually receiving the service is really important and beneficial. But there's also still an opportunity where some organisations and some individuals do want to connect. And so making uh, opportunities for in-person training is also really important. A good example with this, with, about this would be, for example, collections training, where actually you really want to get hands on with those collections. You really want to put that practice um, in place. And then finally, just to say, uh, one of the key things that we look to do with Southwest Museum Development is we look to squeeze as much value as possible out of that Arts, Grants, Arts Council's grant investment. We want to really make that money sweat for the benefit of museums across the region. So over the past year, three years, on average, we've been able to secure 90 pence for every £1.50 of grant count, Arts Council's grant investment, which has meant we've been able to do more work, offer more support, but also offer more targeted support with, with that additional investment, which is really powerful. 
This is a really short summary. I've just got the link here on this slide to our annual review, which tells you much more in depth the stories and um, some of the information about the projects from each of these funders, Up Fund, Heritage Fund and Historic England, who invested in our programme over the years. So at this point, I'd like to just talk a little bit more specifically around what the impact of the pandemic has had on museums in the region and on museums specifically in Devon. So I've just pulled out one particular statistic here, which I think is particularly pronounced for museums in Devon. So obviously there was an enforced closure of museums um, where museums had to close their doors. And then there was a period where we were able to reopen, but that was quite challenging. There were um, sort of closures and then reopenings and also significant restrictions on the numbers and the spaces that we could open during that time. The point of this slide is to really highlight that in general across um, the southwest of England, 82% of museums either hadn't opened or had significantly fewer than 10,000 visits. The point I want to make today is that actually was even more pronounced in Devon, so we can see that increase to 91%. And I think a lot of that has got to do with some of the challenges around buildings and their ability to be COVID secure because of the small spaces but also very importantly around the workforce and how many of the workforce are volunteers and weren't necessarily comfortable or able to come back at the levels they had been in order to operate full opening at that time. What's also a sort of um, a secondary impact as a result of that reduction in opening and the reach of, of visitors is the knock-on impact in terms of the economic impact of those visitors. So if we draw back to 2018 and look at the last full year where there was no impact around COVID, we can see there are around 2.2 uh, 2 million visitors to museums across Devon. And we can see the considerable um, economic impact that those um, museum visitors generate for the, for the Devon area. So 43 million, which is really powerful. And as I mentioned, we'll be really interested to see when we get the um, results of the annual museum um, survey for this year just passed, the degree to which those visit numbers have bounced back and whether we've been able to recoup some of those losses in terms of the economic impact of visitors. So now I'm just taking a moment to focus on specifically the investment in East Devon's museums, I've just drawn this very sort of summary chart really to show you a little bit of a balance around the value for money that East Devon, um, Sidmouth and Budley Sild Dudley Solston's councils have generated in return for their investment. I think it's important to point back to that earlier slide. We wouldn't be it wouldn't be possible to deliver the scale or the local nature of the support we provide without the support of local authorities. So although Southwest Museum Development invests 160,000 each year in museum development offices, there's a further 120,000 that comes from all of the local authorities that contribute across the region, which means a really powerful investment in that support for museums. So as you can see here, um, there's been investment across um, in terms of the museum development officer provision. There's obviously been um, investment in things like the support from the specialist services that I mentioned earlier around collections, digital engagement, volunteering and audience development. There's been investment around skills and training and projects, but there's also been direct grants. So uh, a little over 5,500 in direct grants to the museums in East Devon. And as I mentioned, there's a lot more detail about how this money has been spent and the activity that's been delivered in our annual review that I um, highlighted a moment ago. And so at this point, finally, I just have the opportunity to share with you some exciting new news, which is around a project which we have developed with Art Fund, where we've just been able um, to launch and announce a further £373,000 worth of funding for small grants to museums across England. And um, these are grants between 500 and 3000 pounds, which will enable museums, but also in partnership with galleries and historic houses to engage with schools and families to um, celebrate and to build um, confidence in knowledge around the UK's natural environment and biodiversity. So this is really about drawing inspiration from art and objects in museums, historic houses and galleries, and also to develop specifically creative and learning opportunities, all culminating in a big celebration on, on Earth Day on the 22nd of April 2023. 
I highlighted this particularly because um, we really hope that the museums and galleries and historic houses of East Devon might be interested in the consortia approach. In working with the Art Fund, Museum Development England were able to really explain some of the um, capacity challenges that museums are experiencing. So we emphasise the importance of being able to provide funding that it covers 100% of project costs. This is a really challenging time to be asking for cash match funding. But also if there are existing staff and equally, if you want to fund freelancers or other creatives, you can use up to 50% of your project costs to do that. And then finally, as I mentioned, you can apply as a consortia, which I think is a really powerful and useful way to minimise some of the capacity and pressure on organisations, but also a really sustainable way to work collectively and in partnership with other organisations in your locality to engage young people. So hopefully that's an exciting opportunity to consider. And finally, just to say, um, I mentioned about our annual review that shows a lot more detail, but also I'm really happy to take any questions that if you don't think of them now, please don't hesitate to drop me a message. Okay, I'll just stop sharing now. Thank you very much. Um, let's have a look, see if we have any questions. Uh, Councillor Moulding again. Yes, only really just again, because Axford Heritage Centre was mentioned as one of those who has been supported by Southwest Museums, I will need to declare an interest. Uh, and ORI. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from oh, Councillor Desarum. You're here now. Hi. Hi there. Sorry, sorry, I was late, Chair. Um, yeah, no, just, no worries. A very, very good presentation, Vic. Really, very stimulating. Um, and I, I, and I wanted to ask. If, I hope I have got this right. That Exmouth is not part of your your museum network. And I wondered whether that is, has an impact on the sort of the way the museum could could be run. Because obviously, by being part of your network, you've shown us how how much support you get, etc. Uh, uh, and the presentation shows this. So I wondered whether you had any thoughts of how we could encourage, say, the museum like Exmouth to be to become part of this, um, so they could benefit uh, and do a lot more than they are perhaps currently doing. I, I'm not wishing to say they're doing badly, but obviously, uh, is it the word united together, we are stronger rather than divided. So um, I, I'd be very grateful to hear your thoughts, Vic. Thank you. Yes, well, um, I know that Exmouth used to be accredited um, and then dropped out of the scheme, but there always, obviously there is always support available to help them consider if they consider that useful to come back into accreditation. The point to mention, I suppose it's a, a bit of a point of detail, but I suppose it is important that the funding that we receive is based on a formula of the number of accredited museums in our region. So effectively, our core funding is only based on the number of accredited museums. However, we're also really aware that it doesn't necessarily work as sim simply as that. So, for example, our work with Art Fund and our work with Historic England hasn't limited us to just delivering that support to um, accredited museums. And also, secondly, and very importantly, because of that added investment from local authorities, Exmouth Muse Museum are always welcome to access our free training to access our very, very detailed and comprehensive resources and guidance that our thematic officers deliver. So Helena has done some amazing um, free resources and video tutorials around things like pest partners. Um, just for those of you that might not understand during COVID when lots of buildings were closed, the people were out, but the pests were still home. So there was a lot of um, activity that needed to be dealt with at that point. So we went to Historic England and they gave us um, a great amount of funding, which would allowed us to develop a project which sent out and issued packs of pest monitoring kits to all museums, over 400 museums and heritage organisations across the southwest. And we were able to provide those sorts of services. So the door is definitely not closed on Exmouth. They can definitely access a lot of our services. But in order to be in that sort of, as you mentioned, that cohort of accredited museums, they would need to consider whether that was appropriate and they wanted to come back into the accreditation scheme. Thank you so much. Uh, cheers, uh, Bruce. Good question and a nice, concise answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Charlie. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Vic. Uh, I endorse what Bruce said, a really thought-provoking presentation. And a couple of things there really resonated, I think, with our own cultural venues within East Devon District Council, particularly around the sort of recovery phase. And like you, we'll be analysing the pre-COVID as opposed to the post-COVID um, recovery and how far you know we are in terms of 
recovering sort of income and footfall, but particularly around volunteers, because I know how much um, Southwest Museums relies on volunteers. And we've seen a bit of a trend in uh, certain areas of our work um, where we were heavily reliant on volunteers. And it's been quite hard work actually bringing some of those volunteers back into you know, our work uh, work environment for, for lots of reasons. Obviously, COVID's changed people's outlook on life and um, lifestyle choices have, have been made. And I know across the countryside team and also with the gallery in particular, you know, there have been some fairly um, unique challenges in there. So it'll be interesting to see how um, you progress with bringing your volunteers back and what um, techniques, you know, you're using to, to encourage them uh, to come back. So that's very much my thoughts. Also, just quickly, Chair, um, within the culture strategy, two things. Um, when the cultural producers in post, really keen to have the post holder working closely with Southwest Museums. I think there's some really good synergy there and opportunities to work together. And uh, it's also within our culture strategy, which I'm sure Vic knows under theme one, strengthen the people that do. And specifically action, I've got in front of me 1.12, which says enhance the quality and appeal of collections and the sustainability of local museums through a program of shared capital investment in display interpretation. So I'm going to touch a little bit on that in my sort of right, right at the end on the Royal Prosperity Fund and where there may be some opportunities for us to, um, to, to collaborate and work together. So um, just to uh, put that out there for, uh, for later. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Charlie. Um, John Golding. Hi, John. Hi, Chair. Thank you. Uh, and a follow on from Charlie, really. I, I think probably a bit like Charlie, I've been checking back our um, cultural strategy, which of course was the big ticket item at your your last meeting. Uh, and I'm just uh, really grateful that for both speakers so far today um, are really helping us drive some of those quite significant ambitions forward in terms of um, certainly what Vic was saying just now about one of the projects looking at the outdoors, uh, the inclusivity, the diversity, all those sorts of things that we we value and, and have objectified, if you like, in the, the strategies uh, coming to life. And it's it's really great to hear. Thank you. Cheers, John. Um, OK, if we don't have, if we have no further questions, um, thank you so much, Vic, for coming and speaking. It was, um, that was really, really interesting. Um, so we move to item seven now, um, Libraries Unlimited. Um, so do we have, uh, is it Ray Hall and Rachel Payne from Libraries Unlimited? Hello, yes, it's Ray Hall, me, and it's um, Steve Turner is joining me from Libraries okay. Unlimited. Um, shall I try to share my screen? Let's try that. That's working. Excellent. So I, I'm going to give um, a fairly broad overview. I'm Ray Hall. I'm the creative communities producer for Libraries Unlimited. So my role is to sort of bring cultural programming to all of the libraries in Devon and Torbay, or at least be the, the um, person who opens the door to allow programming in. Um, our strap line is enriching lives, building communities. And um, as you can see in this picture, uh, that's one way of using a library to sort of um, feel comfortable, get warm, but um, we want to engage our customers so that they, oh, that's not working. Um, okay, I've missed one, that's fine. So they engage with us a little bit more actively um, and become audiences and co-creators with us. So um, this is the Arts Council's investment principles when we are, we are an MPO, we're, in our, we're um, coming to the end of our first round of MPO and waiting to hear for our second round. Um, so we are, they invest in ambition and quality, dynamism, inclusivity and relevance and environmental responsibility, and so do we. And um, the Arts Council want to have creative people a creative and cultural country and cultural communities. So that is what we're all about. So the investment principles um, 
at the Arts Council align very much with ours, um, with people at the centre of things. Um, so the, the brand that we have been functioning under is called Evolve, and you'll find on Libraries Unlimited website, there is a sort of Evolve um, place where all the things we've been doing sits. And we are actually going to phase out this brand and sit everything under the banner of Libraries Unlimited because that is simpler for the end user. And um, it, it is better profile for libraries to have all this cultural cultural happenings going on underneath that rather than this extra brand. So to date, we have, um, let's move on to the next one, work to date. We've um, had a year of programming before things be were brought to a halt by, by COVID. We've had some um, digital touring activity, um, a, a lot, unlocking the cage and Lost Librarian, which is a sort of digital escape room. We've started to trial Library Lates, which is opening the libraries um, in the evenings and putting on um, performances, music, silent discos, poetry, um, comedy. And that's um, we've tried two of those in Exeter and we are intending to roll those out in Barnstable, Paynton and other larger libraries. Um, the picture in the middle there is James Lake um, in a pop-up library, which we've been trialling on Exeter High Street. Um, he's making a commission of a, of, a, of a giant tree, which is going to go to Barnstable Library. So this is where we work on commissioning artists to work, making things for libraries or working with library communities to make things or, or in residency. Um, so some of the other things we've been involved in there are design thinking, which is a sort of training for library staff, uh, Litcraft, which is a sort of touring like Minecraft, but exploring books. Um, that was unlocking the cage top right. And the other one is a touring exhibition, um, the glass room. What if you spoke was um, working with young writers um, and some of them had their work in, pr in print, in pen to print, which is a magazine. That's the, um, that's the pop-up library in the middle there. On the right is a VR booth, which is being designed for Exeter Library. Um, in the middle there is, is Ingrid Pollard, as you'll all know, um, an exhibition at the Thelma Hulbert. And we worked closely with Honiton Library to have some associated workshops to complement that. So the coming season of MPO activity, we are working in three seasons. Um, Pride of Place is the first one. Get Creating will be the second one and Building a Better Tomorrow will be the third one. This gives us an opportunity to market across all our libraries better and to find partnerships um, with people like Meyer and Vic and work better in partnership with other cultural providers. We intend to continue with Library Lates and opening libraries sort of outside hours to let, um, let more cultural things happen inside of them. We've got a touring film Films in your library, which was Discovery Screens, but we're calling it Films in the Library now, where um, we work with, with libraries to work out what films they want. We get the licenses and we support them to screen those films with um, some of them have their own screening facilities and others. There's a, there's a sort of touring mobile capacity for, for, for filming screens in your library. Uh, and we're now working on a, on a cultural credits, credit scheme to enable us to use our Arts Council funding across all the libraries in Devon and Torbay. Um, and obviously there's 50 odd of those. And this is something which will help us for, to give more libraries a, a piece of the cake, if you like. And um, that's about partnering with other pro producers and promoters like Villages in Action and and opening the door and hosting other tour touring offers and, um, and also sort of creating some of our own, continue to commission new artworks. Uh, and that's, that's touring, which we've covered and um, staff training. So this is just an overview of what libraries are all about. Want to inspire a love of reading and reduce literacy inequalities. We want to provide free access to resources and information, support health and well-being. We're keeping the message, the campaign for sort of come in and get warm. 
get company, don't feel lonely, support business startups. We want to reduce isolation. A lot of our programming is about bringing people in and feeling together, empowering by developing digital skills, um, and then just feeling the benefit of cultural experiences. This was the slide that Rachel was going to deliver. I don't know if you want to say anything on that, Steve. I will do. Thank you, Ray. Um, can everybody hear me? Um, if I just introduce myself, so I'm Steve Turner. I'm head of commercial at uh, Libraries Unlimited. So, so Ray's giving you an overview of our, um, I suppose, our Arts Council funded funded program. And what I just wanted to do was just give you a bit more of an overview of of the rest of the stuff that we do as as an organisation. And as the slide says there, so we're a we're a charity um, that was spun out in 2016 from uh, from Devon County Council. So we're an independent organisation. We run uh, libraries, public libraries across Devon and Torbay, um, and there's um, there's 50 to, 54 of those across that that patch. We have uh, four mobile libraries as well, so covering about over 300 communities um, across uh, across Devon. So a pretty extensive network in your area in East Devon. Then I was just totting them up as everyone else was speaking. I think we've got about nine libraries in um, in East Devon. So a pretty good network. Um, we've also got some activity in Cranbrook. We've got an expansive network of mobile libraries um, in there. We're a charity. So as the slide says, Everything that we do, we we fundraise, we bring in a whole range of different programs and activities, goes back into the services that um, that we deliver. We serve quite an expansive population. Um, just some interesting statistics for you as well, because um, our AGM was just last night, uh, which apologies, that's why my uh, my uh, my name said staff until someone's just changed it for me. Um, so we've got about one and a half million visits to libraries each year. So pretty good, pretty great, fantastic footfall of people. We, we issue about 1.3 million books um, per year. That's just books. We've got a range of uh, e-books, e-audio books and other activities as well that are free for people to access and use. Um, and we've got about 112,000 active members so people are actively going in and using our resources the ones that we track there's other people that just come into our spaces and use our spaces as warm friendly spaces to sit down have a cup of coffee have a chat meet friends all of those sorts of things so we're a great space for addressing social social isolation encouraging inclusion all those sorts of things basically um we are um Ray's touched on um, all the MPO activity that we operate. She start, started talking briefly about some of the other stuff that we do, which is worth mentioning here as well, that um, we have our um, business and intellectual property centre, um, which provides support to businesses across the whole of, of Devon, including in, in East Devon. So currently that's funded by uh, the British Library. We have a fantastic programme, both online and in person, of events and activities, uh, as well as a whole range of resources if you want to start up in business. And if you are particularly interested in making sure that you're protecting intellectual property when you're starting in business, that's quite a unique service for, for this part of the, uh, of the country. Um, in Exeter and in Barnstable, we have two fabrication laboratories so we can get access to small scale digital making technology and you can do some training and introduce yourself in terms of what digital making means. So it's a great resource for for hobbyists, for young people, and for businesses uh, to use. And Ray's already mentioned our, our warm spaces offer, our, our winter offer, basically, where given the times that we're in at the moment, they're encouraging people to come in, make use of their local community facility, uh, have a cup of tea or coffee, uh, keep warm and chat to each other and talk to our staff and hopefully have a, uh, have a good time. So libraries are a fantastic resource. Um, there's some great arts and cultural stuff that we offer, as Ray has, has highlighted, and there's a load of other stuff that we do as well. We'd be really happy to take any questions from you, so I'm going to shut up talking now. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you very much. Um, is this the part where uh, Councillor Moulding tells us he's been to a library once and 
Clerk, no. Okay. Uh, Councillor Paul Miller. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I've been to a library once myself. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Uh, of, uh, I understand this probably runs contrary to a library's uh, uh, perceived um, sort of identity in, in what I'm about to ask. But in terms of this sort of cultural outreach, has uh, Libraries Unlimited ever done or ever considered hiring out its space of an evening for um, practising musicians? And I don't ask that for a you know, sort of way of promoting myself personally or anybody else. It's just a, an issue, for example, in Exmouth, where there is um, a lack of space for um, musicians to, to practise. And it seems, you know, I just look at these lovely library buildings that are often empty of an evening and, and wonder whether they could be hired um, by, by such musicians. Would, would, it, would, would it be um, an acceptable part of, a, of your strategy or anything you've ever considered, I guess is my question. No problem if this is a non-starter, just, uh, just struck me as an idea. No, no, I'm very happy to answer that. And absolutely, we, we hire out our spaces all the time. Um, and it's a key part of, of what we do and generating other income for us as well. So absolutely. If you've got people who you know who would like to, to hire the spaces, then absolutely put them in touch with, uh, with me and I can share my email address in the, in the chat. Thanks very much. And I presume that hopefully there won't be any sort of sound um, uh, sort of levels, you know, no, sh no shushing from any library. Because <laughs> I do understand it probably doesn't seem as though it's in keeping with what people perceive libraries to be for but uh, I just there, I, I, there, yeah. there, there was a campaign a few years ago actually which was all about called loud in libraries I think which is trying to get over that uh, perception that uh, that libraries have to be quiet so you can make as much noise as you like in our libraries in all honesty and people do so yeah welcome it though Councillor Miller please do not take your piano in and practice during the day um thank you very much uh Councillor Hookway, Nick. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Steve, for your presentation, um, which I was very interested in, but it's raised two completely separate questions. Um, firstly, I heard you mention uh, uh, several times uh, libraries in Barnstable and Paynton, and they seem to be uh, very much in the forefront of your work. But um, what... Um, initiatives are you developing in libraries in East Devon? And I'm particularly concerned about uh, Exmouth Library, which is my local library. Um, how are you um, uh, uh, intending to develop that or, or, pro or produce new initiatives? Okay, well, um, at the moment, we've got a pilot uh, for the cultural credit scheme in uh, Axminster, Colleton and Seaton, not Exmouth, but we had that little cluster of libraries are sort of piloting um, the cultural credit scheme in January, but Exmouth Library, as all with all libraries, we are keen to set up conversations as to what they would like to have. And it's not a question of just sort of throwing the same thing across all the libraries because they're all different. They're all different sizes. They've all got different communities. They all require a conversation to find out what they want. But um, those conversations are ongoing and um, Exmouth I haven't been in post that long, but Exmouth Library is on the list and we will be having conversations there to see what they would like um, and, you know, programming accordingly or working with them, whether they want participation and engagement or whether they want a performance or, you know, something inside the library or outside the library. Those conversations are happening and we intend to work over the course of the next MPO with all the libraries across Devon and Torbay. So, um, okay, so Sorry, if I can just add to that. So Exmouth is my local library, so it's it's close to my my heart as well. Um, it's one of our biggest, so it's absolutely one of those spaces that we want to make sure that we we make the um, the best of. I was just going to come in and just talk about because again on my list that I, that I that I wrote down that I referred to earlier, then we we've done some quite considerable investments in libraries in um, in East Devon. Um, so Seaton has just undergone, undergone a closure and quite a refurbishment over the past, probably the last quarter of last financial year, I think. So it's a, a much nicer space now. It wasn't that long ago when uh, Ottery Library was actually relocated from its position where it had been for quite, for quite a few years into the old bank when the, the bank relocated, which is with support from a number of different organisations, including the town council. So we do keep on investing in... Um, 
the buildings in uh, in our libraries in in East Devon and the services that uh, that we run out of them. Okay, yeah, thanks so much. My second question, completely different, is about the mobile libraries. Uh, in view of the move towards net zero that the government is now encouraging us to do, how do you see the mobile libraries developing in the future? Huh. That's a very good question. <laughs> um, so we're commissioned by Devon County Council um, for delivering the service. The, the vehicles actually belong to, uh, to Devon County Council. We've said to them that there needs to be some investment given the move to net zero, given that we've got environmental targets as well, to try and make sure that they are far more efficient than, than what they are. They are old diesel vehicles, basically, we don't think it's it's appropriate for those vehicles to be running. Well, to be honest, I don't think they'll be running because uh, they're, they're 10 years old. Then they are uh, past their best, basically. So we've raised that as an issue and a concern with, with Devon County Council to say, we'd just like a conversation with you in terms of how the service can be reshaped in the, in the future. Um, mobiles are one way of taking books to people. We've got our network of existing libraries. We also have um, the e-books and e-resources that I mentioned previously as well. We also have volunteers that deliver books to uh, um, to people in their in their homes as well through the home library service. Those so there's a, a number of different ways of efficiently and effectively uh, accessing uh, resources. Okay, thanks so much, Dave. That thank you. Thanks, Chair. Cheers. Thanks both. Uh, ah, Councillor Moulding. Thank you, Chair. Um, when I was a county councillor some years ago, uh, I remember, and Jill Farrow would be interested, that um, in the Axminster Guildhall, we had probably more people there than we recently had for the Flamingo Pool event, when there was a threat that Axminster Library was going to be closed. I reckon we had about 250 people in Axminster Guildhall who were not very happy with the county council at that time. And uh, as the years moved on and um, the county council decided that the best um, uh, scenario was to create Libraries Unlimited, uh, then uh, for, as far as I can see, Libraries Unlimited have moved on from strength to strength. And they've certainly um, opened up the options for additional use of libraries in a number of ways. And so we're delighted to see that. But um, Axminster Library is, uh, is small. And um, uh, when a Libraries Unlimited uh, took over the library service, it appeared that there was some chance that either Axminster would get a new library or an extended library. But that, at the moment, doesn't seem to have happened. And, and I just wondered if we could have an update on that, please. Yep, happy to answer that, Councillor Moulding. Uh, and thank you for the for the kind words as well about Libraries Unlimited. That's that's appreciated. Um, so Axminster Library, yes, it's, it's slated uh, for a, or should I say, it's due a refurbishment, basically. So it's on our books to be refurbished. We have money in our budget to, to do that. We are waiting at the moment because it's also um, it's it's due to have its roof replaced by Devon County Council. Um, and what we can't do is do the internal refurbishment before it's had its top taken off and, and put back on again. Um, so um, so it's we were trying to get information out of Devon in terms of when that roof is going to be taken off and put back on again, basically. But again, it's it's meant to be in their in their program. Um, so it's still something that we would dearly love to do, and it's it's in our accounts to uh, to do that. I'm hoping this financial year, but until I get that all clear in terms of the Devon schedule for the roof, I, I can't give you that reassurance. I'm afraid. But you've heard it here first from me that it's it's still something that we are due to do. I shall chase up the county councillor. Please do, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Cheers, thank you. Uh, I was going to say councillor Plowden. Uh, Charlie Plowden. <laughs> Am I morphing into one, Chair? Thank you. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, again, thank you to, to Ray and Steve. Um, again, a really interesting presentation. I think it's fair to say this is a evolving 
relationship with East Devon District Council. I think, I mean, I certainly um, have just um, uh, started to notice Libraries Unlimited and come onto my radar. And I think, um, you know, I'm very excited about developing the relationship with Libraries Unlimited. I think it's huge potential. And again, to, um, you know, on a, on a similar level to Villages in Action and Southwest Museums Development Programme. Um, just as a, a point of note, um, again, coming back to the culture strategy, that's my theme for um, this afternoon. Under theme five, new places for culture, it does explicitly state in 5.21, um, where we'll work with local residents, libraries unlimited and other partners to ensure Cranbrook and other new housing developments have an appropriate high quality cultural offer, offer co-designed with local residents. So that's it's pretty wide and broad ranging, but I think that gives us a lot of scope to sit down and, and, and talk with Library Unlimited about how we can develop that uh, particular ambition. And again, uh, hopefully once the cultural producers in post, uh, we can have that conversation. So um, just really to note, Chair, that uh, looking forward to developing this relationship with Libraries Unlimited. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, and thank you to all those who represented Libraries Unlimited. Um, thank you for dragging them, kicking and screaming into the 21st century, which I think is um, is uh, is good because it means they'll still be here, which are, which is what we all want. Okay, so um, we now move to agenda item number eight, the Thelma Hulbert the Thelma Hulbert Gallery. Um, <laughs> The review of the last year and the forward plan, and we welcome uh, Ruth, who um, is, a, is a regular contributor here. Um, and um, yeah, Ruth, very exciting year. Thanks, Joe. I'm just going to share my screen. That's great. Great. Sorry about that. Um, yep. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I think everyone knows me hopefully very well by now. Um, but it does feel like when you start with a, a forum that you're starting from scratch. So I am going to do a bit of a recap of what we've been up to the last couple of years. Um, but there's been so many exciting speakers. I am also going to try and keep it short and sweet and hopefully um, give enough time for some questions. Um, so this is my lovely colleague, uh, Gemma Gervin, who is showing off the fabulous uh, new facade of the Thelma Holbert Gallery and our new title there. So hopefully you've all been over. It did look rather glorious this summer with the sunshine gleaming white from top to bottom. Um, and the importance of THC has continued to grow um, over the years, spearheading new models of rural cultural production and supporting the council in delivering against strategic priorities, including the climate emergency, diversity, equality and inclusion. Um, and the social and economic recovery. Um, as we know, the pandemic has forced a new way of working, helping forge new interdisciplinary partnerships and driving innovative projects and initiatives. Um, here are just a few of THC's highlights from 2020 onwards. Um, so we had some central buildings repaired, the ACE network established, and the cultural strategy was launched, the creative cabin, um, THG had pop-ups at Ocean, we had the Secret Garden development in our historic crop courtyard. Um, we began work on the Abode of Love with Anna Fitzgerald. We forged ahead and piloted some diversity and inclusion training for East Devon District Council. And we also obviously launched climate conversations amongst many other things. This year's highlights were working with award-winning uh, folk singer Kate Young, um, who performed at THG, Be the Change Society from the University of Exeter, who led a climate conversation. Um, outreach and community is thriving again, which I'm delighted to see with Devon Carers, groups coming into the gallery every month. We have at least 25 people squeezed in. Um, additionally, we have um, monthly sessions with Rock Creative, with adults with learning difficulties, 
So in total with their carers, there's about 21 of those chaps coming in every month. Um, and every week we have monthly, uh, sorry, weekly drop-ins with the Devon Recovery Learning Community. So that's folks like with uh, mental health issues. Um, and that group is growing and growing. So they're actually giving them two rooms um, every week now. Um, schools and colleges um, are beginning to enjoy the gallery again. Um, in, including coming into the gallery, but also with the creative cabin. And 140 people um, came to see Ingrid Pollard Private View, which is the current exhibition that we have on um, at the uh, Thalma Holbert Gallery. And I, I will mention again so that she has been known for the Turner Prize, which opens on the 20th of this month. So we've got a sweet spot where we're hoping there's going to be a bit of a, a spotlight on Thalma Holbert and um, East Devon towards the end of the month. Um, we also had award-winning garden designer Transform, our secret, uh, secret gallery, our garden space. Um, and we had exhibitions over at Ocean um, by Mikhail Karakas and Devon Artist Network. Um, so our KPIs look a little bit like this. So this is how we measure broadly um, how THG is performing, donations to sales, engagement and volunteers. Um, and this doesn't look particularly representative, but um, I'll explain why I've pulled out those two exhibitions. So at the spring and the summer in 2022, so the Devon Artist Network, which we strategically programmed to focus on the regional art sector, and then the Ingrid Pollard, which had the international reach. Um, and you can see that our KPIs have returned to exceeded pre-pandemic levels, which is really um, heartening to see. For our Ingrid Pollard programme, we were really, really strategic and it came at just the right time for us. It was actually meant to happen in 2019, but um, because of the pandemic, it came in 2020. And it was good because it gave us enough time to really um, seize the opportunity, but embed a little bit um, or tweak the way that we work um, to really reach new audiences. So we were really strategic in our marketing and PR, um, which included actually we had digital boards in Exeter, which is the first time we've done that. Um, and we, we targeted specific groups. Um, our PR highlights include we've got an article in The Guardian, um, in Aesthetica, Devon Life, BBC Radio Devon, in the Financial Times, to name but a few. Um, so we, we learned a lot of lessons um, through working with um, the partners involved in that project as well, which were the Devon Next Institute, the University of Exeter, like Britain Limited, um, and many others actually. So I think that we, you know, working in partnership has so many um, benefits. Um, not least marketing. Um, some of what I'm saying is quite anecdotal at the moment because we're still in the throes of that show, but I think it's quite interesting just to, just to see how visitors' behaviour is changing. So our evaluation shows that we have many new visitors that have come and there's an increased drive time um, and that we have a 3% increase in visitors from different ethnic heritages. Um, we retain some of the ticketing system that, that we imposed um, during COVID um, uh, which may have contributed to 100% attendance in all of our events, which is incredible. I think we actually had a waiting list for every single event that we've delivered this summer and 70% uh, success in engagement opportunities. Um, we have worked hard to um, retain and recruit our volunteers, as Charlie was saying. Um, so our, our experience is that we just have to have a huge amount, much more flexibility with them and work around there. Um, specific needs and schedules so that we've actually had to have a much bigger pool and, the, and tailor and, uh, our opportunities for that individual. So we have, we have to have to operate at least two volunteers in the building at any one time. So we've now got 11 new ones who've joined us this year and who are on a rotating schedule for weekly front of house shifts. But we also have 10 new volunteers in the garden. Um, so this year our partners have included the Arts Council Collection, AOMB, Arts and Culture of the University of Exeter, Devon Artist Network, Ocean, NHS Devon Recovery Learning Community, Cliff Valley, and many, many more. Um, we've also continued to work out and about um, and the public commissioning activity this year, which focused on sites in Exmet, which Anna will come to talk about all that exciting activity. Um, but also this year, we were um, a, a lot of time spent over in the Cliff Valley working and supporting on the Roots for Roots project. Um, so, looking towards the future, we will be launching our new programme, Landscapes in Time. Um, and in this programme, we'll be exploring changes in natural landscapes and land use, revealing a multitude of stories and connections which cut through time, challenging our perceptions and posing environmental and social questions. So through this programme, we hope to strengthen our connection to landscapes 
uh, both near and far. Um, the exhibitions include Fragile Earth, a body of organic ethereal forms made from organic materials and recycled materials, the only Hampton's language of sea, the photographic series commissioned by RAM, which is exploring our relationship to natural resources and food sovereignty. This is followed by um, an exhibition focused on the Blackdown Hills, working with AOMB, where 36 artists will be following in the footsteps of the Camden Town Group. We then have an exhibition by Karina Wagner and the Tide and Time Bell exhibition, um, which will include a, a film and a sculpture, which is a two metre high bell. Um, we wanted to build um, a specific audience development um, and engagement plan and connection to this exhibition programme in response to what we've learned over the last year or two years even. Um, so a huge amount of work was done by FEI into um, mapping the cultural uh, landscape of East Devon. Um, the evidence base and SWOT revealed a number of key values and concepts. Um, there's two that we have particularly honed in on. Creative enterprise and skills, building an inspiring talent, talent development pathway to the next generation of East Devon creatives and new places for culture, ensuring all East Devon residents, especially children and young people, have the opportunity to experience high quality culture and create creativity where they live. Furthermore, over the last four years, our work with Tate, Artist Rooms, University of Exeter and Talking on Corners, the Inclusion Agency and Audience Agency, has revealed the need and desire for a specific and targeted programme embedding culture and wellbeing within East Devon's growing younger and diverse communities. So we've developed a specific project to do this. Our Young People Inclusivity Arts and Environment programme has been specifically designed to not only enable young people to have the opportunity to experience high quality uh, culture and creati creativity where they live, but to participate co-create and develop pathways for the next generation of these seven creatives through learning and professional opportunities. So we hope this project will create impactful and diverse opportunities for employment, learning, training, and co-creation. So just a snapshot of where we're at with this project is um, I hope to launch in March next year. And we've just got our confirmed partnership with um, Huntington Community College which you think would be an obvious partner for the family Hobbit Gallery, and we do work with them often, but we've actually got the, an actual a formal agreement with the school to work with them for 18 months, which is fabulous. And there's going to be a, a youth network, which we hope will become the pilot for a wider youth network across East Devon, training courses for students around carbon literacy, creative writing and EGI, and for staff, intergenerational workshops, schools visits, curated exhibitions, and the creative cabin will be taken by the youth team all over East Devon sharing the creative program at THG. So uh, against this context, we're also developing our business plan, which interweaves East Devon District's cultural plan and ACE um, is strategy of let's trade. So the East Devon District cultural plan's four-pronged attack is collaborative, connected with nature, diverse and inclusive and resilient. And let's create ambition and quality, dynamism, environmental responsibility, and inclusivity and relevance. So, I hope to have the business plan with the forum by um, the end of the year. And finally, I know I'm well, one of the speakers who always speaks far too fast. So, <laughs> you caught what I've said. Um, but the, uh, going into um, the winter months, we've still got a lot to do. So we actually open another exhibition on Saturday, which is by the, or from the Ugandan Asian program that's been touring the country um, and is with us for a week. So please do pop in and see that. This is on Saturday, um, as you know, the Ugandan Asians were with us 50 years ago um, and they had settlements in Honiton. Um, then we have an exhibition, Talk and Tour. That's the last one of um, the program. Um, uh, 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 of the Ingrid Pollard exhibition. Um, and then we have Present Maker open on the, November the 12th. Um, the next, ne next work meeting today's forum is on the 21st of November. Um, and then if you're all looking for a new resolution, um, we've got an art history series starting in February. Thank you. So not much going on then, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, that's a lot to take in. Crikey, well done. Um, Councillor Arnott. Hello, Paul. Well, that was quick. I got the <laughs> mic for a second, but then putting my hand up, and, and here we are. Um, so th this could be said under the next item, maybe, Chair, but I'll, I'll say it now. Um, 
you know, what a wonderful meeting. Uh, and and uh, what has happened, Ruth has encapsulated it there, really. She's, she's captured it, that this, as much as anything else, this is about opportunities for a future generation to be inspired and to train. And we always know that these, we know these these kids are out there. We know it. We know they're, you know, they're a successful um, everything, artists, quite famous actors kind of coming out. And they sort of, we don't necessarily recall that they're coming from East Devon, but they are. And I just think it's been astonishing to hear how the, the opportunities for inspiration through Villages in Action, through the museums, through the libraries, through the gallery, it's, it's fantastic. It really is. And I think Thelma Hulbert have obviously been ahead of the game uh, in East Devon on that because, because you know, we are sort of as one, so to speak. But it's so encouraging to hear it um, so well, uh, so well sort of uh, defined. Um, we know that the cultural producer role is being advertised now. And, you know, God, I wish I could apply, frankly, because, you know, what an opportunity to step into something at, at, at this time. And then finally, just to say, we, you know, we shouldn't always praise the kind of, you know, the, the heavy hitters and the star exhibitions, but um, the Ingrid Pollard was was extraordinary. Um, and and I, know, I know, you know, there, there will perhaps have been other exhibitions at the Thelma Hall, but in the past, um, that are um, the equivalent of the Ingrid Pollard or whatever, and you know, just as artistically fascinating. But taking it for what it is at face value, it was absolutely brilliant, brilliantly timed. It's the way in which it drew, the way in which she as an artist drew inspiration from nature, effectively in Devon, and from our own history as well, around you know, everything from botany to race, was brilliant. Um, and... Um, I mean, I don't know if, Ruth, you know, but all of our emails that come from yeah. East Devon councillors, or certainly my emails, have got an, an advert at the bottom for the um, Ingrid Pollard uh, exhibition. Um, I, I'm delighted. I have no idea how to get rid of it, frankly, but certainly I must have sent out hundreds of emails pumping it out. So, but anyway, just, Chair, overall, you know, um, just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you, everybody, for this. Sincerely, this is incredibly encouraging. As... Young Mr. Grace said, carry on, you're all doing very well. And, um, you know, for those of you who are old enough to get that reference, which is all of you, I suspect. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, even me, Councillor Honour, even me. Um, uh, Councillor Brewster Sarum, thank you, Paul, for that, for that, for those words. Uh, Brewster Sarum, Bruce. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, how can I follow on from such words from the leader? I was just going to say that, um, as he did as well, I was at the Ingrid Pollard uh, private view. I think Councillor Brown, who's also, I believe, on this call, was also with me. Uh, and I think that we had a very uh, enjoyable uh, cultural evening. So my thanks must go to Ruth and her excellent, magnificent team. Um, and I also did, uh, uh, Chair, you'll be very pleased that I went to the climate conversation as well that was held. So I found out more about climate change. And um, that was also very stimulating from the cop art, the photographer that was doing taking the photographs. So um, I think the gallery has done an awful lot of cultural good uh, for councillors and uh, everyone in the community and, and must be congratulated for doing so. Thank you, Chair. Cheers, Bruce. Thank you. Um, well, if we have no further questions, thank you so much, Ruth. Um, we'll move to um, the AST updates, Arts and Culture East Devon updates, with um, uh, somebody who I, who I could call a close personal friend, um, but not to the point where I think I need to declare anything. Um, Anna Fitzgerald, who is a celebrated international artist and founder of Sea Dog Art, based in Exmouth. Um, she's everywhere, basically. Um, she's and she's a very active member of the ACE Network. And um, a, um, Anna. Yeah, hi there. Hi um, there. <laughs> can I just say thank you, Paul? I really appreciate what you said about Thelma Hulbert, and I fully agree with everything you said, especially the bit about um, representing, you know, supporting the young children and bringing them up. Anyway, yeah, I'm Anna Fitzgerald, and I've got a PowerPoint, but I don't know how to do it, so I'm going to talk instead. 
<laughs> which is probably quite good because I'll just look at the pictures if I've got something in front of me. Um, yes, I um, have just opened Sea Dog Art in Exmouth. I think quite a lot of you do know me, but those that don't, yeah, I'm an artist and uh, I've been working on the seafront recently, the Abode of Love. But about three days ago, I opened one of the galleries in Exmouth. Um, it's called Sea Dog Art. And um, at the moment, we have two galleries and a coffee shop. And in about a month's time, we're going to have another gallery in Exmouth. And next year, we're going to um, have another gallery and also a sculptural park and a art studio space. And it's all non-profit and it's all for the community. And a lot of it is down to Thelma Hull that's supporting us um, to get us going. Anyway, at the moment, there are about 40 artists that I'm supporting, but I'm hoping in about a month's time, there'll be about 400. Um, really what I want to do today is tell you who we are so that you can watch us and follow us and engage with us because I'm very much at the grassroots and I'm very much on the pavement and um, for AST, I'm the champion and I'm to do with the community engagement. And that really is what I do. Um, what can I tell you about where we're at? Well, like I said, we're very much community based and we've got these areas that are selling art from and a coffee shop and all the money is going back into the community for art projects. EDDC have helped us greatly, starting off with the Abode of Love, which is down on the seafront. And in about a month's time, we will be subsidizing children's art classes because um, as Paul mentioned earlier, we very much think that you have to invest in the future and nurture talent. And it shouldn't be down to um, schools or teachers. I think it has to be outside organizations that come in. Exmouth is very, very good at supporting sports at the moment. And I think it would be great if we matched that with the arts and the culture. And that's what we're trying to do here. Um, the other project is on the seafront. And in Ruth's photos, there are a few pictures of us down there. We've been doing the seafront paint now in the Abode of Love for four months. And um, the reason why we started it was there was a lot of hate graffiti down there. And the Abode of Love, for those that don't know Exmas very well, it's the um, flood defences, it's a sheltered area. And um, people use it to meet up, they use it to drink, they use it, a lot of families down there use it because they don't have gardens and they consider that their garden. Um, a lot of people coming to visit Exmouth, that's what they see. They see this abode of love. And I was very uncomfortable with them seeing all this hate graffiti down there. And uh, this is where Thelma stepped in again. And I said, look, I'd really like to take this on as a two year project going down once a week and investing time in this area and putting love back in and showing people that we wanted to make it a place and a community and something that wasn't forgotten. And I suppose this is just a little happy story about how well it's going. We've got, um, on average, we have between 60 and six people going, depending on how bad the weather is, when it's really stormy, there's just six of us down there, but usually there's about 60. And what's really important is most of them are not artists. Most of them are people that want to put love back into that area. And we teach them a little bit of what to do and then they continue. And we've got regulars that go down there and I don't know which which success to tell you so I'll probably tell you quite a few so the first success story are the people that use that place and how they've engaged in it I've sort of said already that there are um, single parent families down there that have um, very limited home life space and they use that as their home they've had, they've painted on the walls and they've made it their own place and I think that's really important so that's the first thing the second thing is we have men that go down there and drink and they were very negative about the space when we went there and in fact they um they really were, were quite um 
vocal about what a disaster it was going to be. I can honestly say now that they come down every week and paint and they're very proud of their work that they've got up there. And they brought their families down to see it and they photograph it every week. And they even contact me to apologize if they can't make it one week, which is just amazing. So we have them. We've got a lot of um, children that have barriers. They either can't go to school for mental health or um, they just didn't, don't engage anywhere else. And they either come down there with their families or they come down there on their own and are working, which is beautiful. There's a strange connection with suicide down there. There's been a few memorial pieces there and quite a few people find the beach and the cliffs challenging and they come down and engage. We've got suicide survivors and people suicidal and that's another area that we're working in and that's it's beautiful to watch them engage we have a lot of people come on their own and are new and they meet up and somebody said last night actually what's what's good about this activity is you're not actually looking at each other you're looking at the wall it's a bit like watching football they said you can actually get close to people and create community without having that difficulty of interaction. So that's what we're doing down there. That's the one side of it. The other side of it is um, when we started, I, I can't really tell you what was written on the walls because it was offensive and um, homophobic and racist and pretty awful. I can tell you now that there are no swastikas on that wall. I can tell you now there might be the odd penis, but badly drawn, obviously. Um, that there won't be a phone number down there. I don't know what that's about. I just think it might be children. It, it could be bullying. So for that reason, we just don't keep full phone numbers. If we see them on the wall, they're removed. Um, and now we've got a bit of a dilemma because now we have um, graffiti, which is positive instead of negative. We've now got graffiti down there saying, you can get over anything if you try and things like this, which isn't part of the art um, the art um, project. We are, we are doing a whole painting of an underwater scene. So now we have to decide, does that stay? But that's quite interesting. We've had to deal with fires down there. We've had to deal with teenagers throwing footballs at us. Um, yeah, they tried to sort of kick over our paint pots. Now they're asking if we can paint urchins so they can use those as football practice. You know, it, it's, it's a really positive experiment, I suppose. Uh, I don't know, that's how you might like to see it. I like to see it as people actually really engaging with the art down there. Um, I haven't got facts and figures. I have got nothing like that because it's so early on. I really, there's nothing I can give out. All I'm doing is introducing us and introducing what we're doing and um, asking you to watch us. You know, Ruth has been amazing in supporting us and we just want to support everyone else paul you want a music practice place we've got one for you Ta -da. you know we really you know village is an action we'd love to be involved with you i'm very much an artist i'm not very good at music and i'm not very good at um theater and things like that i need other people to come on board and join us I say to everybody that's buying a coffee, which is a pretty awful coffee because we've only opened three days ago and I can't say it very good yet. But everybody that's bought a coffee, I say, well, now you're a shareholder. Where do you want the money to go? It is very much that kind of a, a business structure that I'm setting up. And um, yeah, I'm just here to say hello. This is what we're doing. It's really working down on the seafront. And um, I have one agoraphobic teenager who hasn't been able to leave the home for, for years. And she's down on the seafront. She's very, very talented. And I've said, if anybody can come up with a project that she could design next, that would be amazing. And that would be life-changing. And I'm sort of hoping that you people here will put us on your radar. Because I think um, some of you know me from other events, but yeah, we've come back as Sea Dog Art and it's not just me, but it's about 400 people, hopefully, if not more, I don't know. I don't know where you put the deadline on who's involved, but um, yeah, that's what I've got to say, really. So, yeah, questions. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Anna. Um, yeah, again, again, wow. That, I mean, having been involved, well, I say involved, um, having 
uh, painted a square and and and, and yeah. signed the name in the very very early days of the abode of love thing. Um, it's good to see that it's that it, that it's moved on from my awful squiggle. Um, <laughs> I will. I, I I must come down and and um, and have a look and and take part. Yeah, uh, do. you could do with some torches. It's getting dark now at night. Okay. Somebody turned up with a mobility scooter yesterday, and that was quite helpful because they had a light. <laughs> And I'm sure the coffee's not that bad. Um, Paul Miller. Thank, thank you. That was a beautiful mm. presentation, I thought, from, from Anna. It certainly moved me. Um, I don't think Anna needs facts and figures to, um, to emphasise how that space, and I refer to the abode of love, um, on the you know by the sea has, has improved significantly. And I speak, I speak as somebody who's grown up in the town and remembers what it was like before, before Anna and her wonderful team of artists and volunteers got involved and you know I think Anna referred to, to um, it being used as a memorial I lost a, a, a friend through suicide a few, a few months back and it was that space was used for that purpose so I personally want to thank Anna because if it wasn't for her that space wouldn't have been able to have been used wow. in, in that way um, and um, yeah, uh, just just to just to be clear on a on a lot more lighthearted note about my um, my question about musical practice, but I have to be clear, not for personal benefit. I can't use this forum. Uh, Paul, you could do this in practice. For personal me. benefit, but I do believe um, it, it it would be great. But you know, it's good for the community. So thanks for the feedback there. I might take her up on. I might take Anna up on that offer. But yeah, just to go back to the serious point, I think. You know, no facts and figures are needed. People, anybody that wants to see the difference that's been made down there just needs to go go down and, and, and take a look for yourself. It's, it's a wonderful piece of work and long may it continue and long may the District Council support what Anna has been doing. Thank you. Thank you. I can talk forever, but can I just put in on that note that I know we're very much um, heavy Exmodian base here on this meeting, but quite interestingly, the people that are coming down to the seafront, I would say more than 50% are outside of Exmouth. It's, it, it is a bigger thing than just Exmouth, this. I, we've got people traveling down from Bristol, people I don't know, to be involved, which is very strange. But yeah, watch this space. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, Councillor Nick Hookway. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, yes. A big thank you to, uh, again to, uh, to Anna, mirroring what uh, Paul Miller was saying. Uh, fantastic achievement that you've achieved there, turning that round uh, and making it so so positive. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a really uh, uh, fantastic illustration of the the power of art, of uh, art and uh, artistic endeavour. Also, uh, I was very interested to hear what you said about uh, the memorials and the, 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 how some people view cliffs and beaches as, as threatening and perhaps there's elements of suicide. It is not known because it's kept quiet that the lifeboat um, does more work in rescuing people who are trying to commit suicide, particularly on Falcon Point, than, than it does in, in, in rescuing just people in boats uh it is it is a big issue um in exmouth because of the uh, you know people feel it's sort of the uh, the end uh, uh, end of the country and so on um but it's never talked about it's not the lifeboat people don't encourage it at all so i think you have highlighted a very important point and i think again this is another example of where art and culture are helping people's health and well-being so thank you again for that thank you chair Cheers, Nick. Um, Ruth. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to uh, echo everyone's um, thanks to Anna because it's it's such an interesting model of commissioning, and it would only happen with the en energy, enthusiasm, passion, commitment that Anna has brought to it. It gets she goes above and beyond, and I'm just I'm really hoping that actually that that we will um, be able to look at this project within wider public art commissioning, um, because I think what Anna's doing is breaking, breaking new ground through her, the generosity of her spirit and her tenacity, um, which has also been in the way that she's approached Ocean. I just wanted to put a spotlight on that um, bit of activity that Anna's been doing as well. So we, in 2021, started piloting working with Ocean as an exhibition space, because there was a call in this forum to think about what Ocean is, um, and Anna 
bravely took that uh, baton from me and has got an exhibition in Ocean at the moment. Where the future of that space is still, I think, uncertain, but I just wanted to thank Anna as well for that. Thanks, Ruth. Um, yes, uh, what's happening next to Ocean? Um, at the moment, I've got the space filled with my art just because I'm holding the place. But we've got a really exciting exhibition coming up as soon as we've got the energy after getting the coffee shop set up. I don't know if any of you know about Michael Buckland. He's um, an Exmouth treasure, somebody said the other day. He's been painting Exmouth for the last 60 years and he's got catalogues of paintings. Um, he's very much a cafe painter. He sits in cafes and he draws people. Earlier this year, he was diagnosed with dementia and he's been struggling to come to terms with that. And his biggest outlet is usually um, Devon Open Studios, because he didn't manage to get in time to get involved with Devon Open Studios. So in about a month's time, we'll be doing a, not a retrospective of Michael Buckland's, but what he wants to do is a, um, a joyous exploration of where his art's going to go now that he has dementia. And um, he's over the moon about the exhibition and I can't wait to get, um, I can't wait to get publicity out about that and what he's doing. So if you want to support us, please go to Ocean, please see his exhibition and please tell Ocean how brilliant it is. That's what we really need. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, and cheers Ruth. Councillor Ollie Davy. Ollie. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I know, uh... Michael very well actually we used to live in the same road and I taught his son at primary school oh, right. so yeah. I know him very well um, and he's a lovely man and I often see him walking around for me uh, one of the themes that come out very strongly from everybody today has been how much outreach and engagement um, we have been doing and and it's it's kind of about opening doors, isn't it? And and welcoming people in, but also going out and finding those audiences. And I'm, uh, you know, this is just an invitation to anybody really to comment. Could we do more to engage those people who, who don't normally engage with the arts? Could we be doing even more? Anna's obviously given us some fantastic examples of. <laughs> You can't get much harder to reach, I think, than the uh, cider drinkers down at the uh, abode of love. So if you get them in, you can get anybody in. But um, could we could we be doing more? And what could we do to draw in those people? That's a good question. Um, I, 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 hopefully, the culture strategy will, um, will will address some of that. That's a big question to ask here. Um, um, Ellie. Thank you. Uh, I'm a councillor in Ottery St. Mary, but uh, up to all sorts of other things. Uh, what re really interests me today of this meeting is that uh, tomorrow I'm attending a meeting at the RDD, which uh, the, it's called the, uh, and in that or through that meeting, uh, the one of the programs we have there is, and it's also part of the new health bill to avoid loneliness and isolation in older people. And much of what was said today uh, got me working, wearing in my head that there are lots of things that we could use from what you all are doing in linking with the health and care system. And that is uh, a big, I mean, it, the, the, I think very few people know that because of the new health bill, uh, we no longer have a CCG clinical commissioning groups. It has all been replaced now by another system called uh, Integrated Care Organization. And they have a board that is the top, and then you've got another five or six different groups that uh, are contributing to the health and well-being of all of us. But I would very much like to take what I'm hearing from you the day forward tomorrow at this meeting with the RDND or organized by the RDND. And I will try to, I've made some notes of uh, all your speakers and you may hear from us 
possibly not only in a just local autism Mary context, but a wider context that is health and well-being, uh, that is the NHS and social services aspects. That's all I want to say. Thank you very, very much. I mean, I think one of the frustrating things is, is we, all, we, we have here a, um, a desire and part of the strategy is to, is to do with um, sort of improving people's mental health and, and just general well-being. And there isn't to have that direct link with um, with with sort of the, the NHS, it, it, you know, more, more of them. It would be really, really useful because th th that they know who our potential well, I guess client base would be, or the people that we want to engage. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I hope to be successful. I can't promise. Absolutely. Just put lots of posters up with the ACE logo on, just everywhere. They can't ignore us. Then, um, thank you very much, Ellie. Um, John, John Golding. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, picking up on on that, I was at uh, a meeting of the um, One Devon uh, organisations of NHS and social care. So working on the um, integrated care strategy that has to be agreed by uh, December this year. And one of the things that I was able to do was to push the health and well-being agenda. So this is mainly primary care people at these meetings, but I was encouraged that uh, there was good recognition that preventative type health, uh, good mental health, uh, activities, reducing social isolation. Some of the things that Ellie picked up seems to be on the agenda. So it'd be really welcome if um, Ellie keeps pushing that, that message, uh, it will get home. And, and just picking up in, in terms of what Ollie said, Ollie Davey, um, I think we've made massive strides in terms of outreach type, type work. It was something that was very conscious on our agenda a few years ago, uh, and particularly with the gallery, uh, it was great for Honiton, but other areas were quite envious. And, and Ruth and the team has done a great job in terms of um, moving outreach, moving activities out in, the, in more communities. Uh, uh, but I think you're right, there is much more to do, and perhaps through the forum, it will help us um, realise some of the the benefits of that that outreach work thanks chair thanks john absolutely um another example of the outreach work is the creative cabin and every time i've seen it um anna fitzgerald has been there so uh yeah um charlie plowden yeah just very briefly thanks chair just to echo john took the words out of my mouth i'm going to say the work that uh ruth's been doing with her, within our, her team has been a sort of real exemplar of best practice with the outreach work and it's been a real focus and a success story as well over the last two or three years uh, in terms of the scope and really taking out the fantastic work that the gallery perhaps was doing within the building itself but now creating opportunities for all of our communities to engage and I think that's a really good model um, you know for us to look at so be good to have a Separate discussion with Ollie, um, you know, around this area outside of the meeting, particularly when the culture producers in. And also just as an aside on Ellie's point, um, those of you remember Holly, um, who was the or who is the FEI who, um, consultant who led the strategy. She's just been appointed as I think director for health and well-being with the Arts Council England and is taking up that post, I think, in about two or three weeks time. And I did say to her when I spoke to her. Could we please work with you um, with any pilot work around your new area? And she said, yes. So maybe a bit of serendipity there. Um, but I think that could be an opportunity to um, to work with uh, someone who knows us very well over the last sort of six months or so. So I'm keen to sort of follow up on that contact. Thanks, Charlie. Um, John Astley, I noticed, um, have you, have you, were you putting your hand up then? Okay. I, 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 yes, were you just, okay, no, because it was an applause thing, but that's fine. Uh, yeah, John. Oh, sorry. That's <laughs> right. The wrong logo. No worries. Just the wrong logo. 
Uh, uh, just quick, we're just going on to the conversation that's, that's been had. Um, for those people who don't know, um, I'm also a part of the ACED forum. I'm the education champion. And uh, I've met some people here regularly. And it seems to me that, you know, a lot of the things that people have said in this last recent conversation is actually got to do with community education. Um, and that one of the most important things we can do is all be educating each other about the value of arts within our culture, our different culture groups. And certainly, I think this is one of the many conversations that we've already had within the ACED forum. And once the once the culture strategy is underway and the new person is in post, this, from my point of view, has got to be a major focus that we've got to use besides anything else, all forms of communication that we possibly can to engage people across East Devon, including local newspapers and uh, various other sites that are available for people to gather information, to engage people to want to be involved and to contribute their skills and their experience uh, to the greater uh, challenges that we've all got around the development of arts generally and making things accessible uh, and as democratic as possible. So I just wanted to emphasize that that's something that we've got to work a lot on uh, in the next year or so. Cheers. Um, that's certainly noted, John. Thank you. Um, we have no further, no further hands. So, um, cheers, Anna, and 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 thanks for that. And um, that was that was a, a, a real feel good moment. Um, so we now move to the last agenda item, um, an update on the culture strategy and other matters from Charlie. Thanks, Chair. Can everybody see that? Yep. Great. Okay, um, I'll be super, super quick. So I'm conscious that we're beyond our time. Um, and I just want to do a quick uh, summary of where we're at with delivering the culture strategy, uh, an update on just progress and action since it was adopted in July. Um, so in terms of uh, actions, I'm conscious that uh, you'll all appreciate it's a very ambitious strategy. And I think the meeting so far has um, only accentuated that point where a lot of references back to the strategy, being able to pick that particular issue up, cultural producer, being able to work with various organisations. So um, a lot of ambition, which is great. And we are organisationally within East Devon District Council, starting from... Uh, a standing start with many of the aims, um, but to reassure you all, we um, we prepared a 10 year strategy with that very much in, in mind where we'll have time to evolve and develop uh, some of the par partnerships and outcomes, especially around placemaking and uh, cultural tourism over a reasonable period of time. So going on to the here and now, uh, I think it's fair to say we've made some really good early inroads into some of the strategy's ambitions as the slide will detail, and I've only got one slide to reassure you. Um, so first up, the three-year UK Share Prosperity Fund is a very timely and welcome opportunity to pump prime our cultural programme, especially around supporting our significant and critical network of volunteers working in our local cultural venues, such as theatres, museums, galleries. And the purpose of the cultural training programme will be to provide essential knowledge and expertise in areas that will help support the ongoing running and funding of these cultural venues. And it's proposed to cover areas such as writing funding applications, developing marketing and comms plans, developing business plans, writing interpretation plans and so on. So it's good to hear actually what Vic was talking about within the uh, museum sector and um, how advanced they are you know, with their uh, training program. So I'll certainly be um, having a conversation with you Vic about that. and. Uh, how um, how you are targeting and um, ensuring that you're drawing in as many um, of those who work in the museum sector to to take up the the training program. Um, also, alongside this, we want to put in additional support to the ACE network as it grows in influence uh, across East Devon. Uh, I think uh, we all hope that the network will ultimately become self-supporting, and that will be one of the the key roles of the cultural producer in the first couple of years of the uh, the post. Uh, we have plans to create uh, a website for uh, the network 
and to create a what's on directory, which has been identified by its members as crucial to sharing information and networking across its membership, as well as annual programs of events and activities. Share Prosperity Fund will also help to explore the potential to create a youth forum for culture in the district. Just picking up on some of the comments we've heard today about the, uh, the real importance of engaging in a much more meaningful, meaningful way this important age group and the youth forum we hope will enable a direct pathway as well as have a voice for how we shape and evolve our work in the cultural and creative arts sector. And also uh, the creation of a cultural compact for East Devon will also be explored, uh, looking at utilising the Share Prosperity Funds. This will be a small board of creative arts and cultural professionals who can help provide expert opinion, advice and support to aspects of the strategy where we may be considering making a significant funding application. We'll be looking to the cultural compact to provide important oversight on the delivery of the strategy and providing sector ex expertise to the cultural producer. This will be an invitation only body and its work will, will be reported into this forum, the ACE forum. Secondly, the Rural Prosperity Fund is a new and linked fund to the Share Prosperity Fund and has a cultural dimension which is the side, uh, as the slide you can see um, on section two explains that it's capital only and will be used to support our community buildings that have an important cultural function in their locality. The funds will help uh, many of these buildings which are old and expensive to run to transition to a carbon zero future with amongst other things, energy efficient heating systems such as heat air, heat air, air source pumps and PVs. Uh, schemes three years as well, and it runs alongside the Share Prosperity Fund. The full details are yet to be announced, but is anticipated that it will run from April 2023 with a budget of around about 420,000 allocated for this type of work. And finally, Chair, uh, the appointment of the cultural producer is underway, as has been noted, and we're hopeful an appointment will be made by this Christmas. And it goes without saying the po post holder has an exciting and also challenging work program to deliver. For me, the key to ensuring whoever is appointed uh, is, and is enabled to make significant uh, headway with the delivery of the culture strategy will be around the producer okay. developing effective collaboration across mm -hmm. the sector. And alongside this expectation management on what level of involvement one individual can get involved with which will obviously be my task as the manager of the post, because as you can appreciate, there is huge ambition in the culture strategy and its delivery plan. And there are multiple organisations, partnerships, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, the post holder will need to get involved with. So I think, you know, those initial months, um, the cultural producer will be looking to get out and about and meet as many people as possible to ensure that, uh, she or he is well connected within the whole cultural ecology of the district and that's my lot thank you for your time chair and the ace forum you're on mute joe as well you you're finishing as you started does it well i've bookended it with a mute haven't i yeah. um Oh, it's doing so well. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Charlie, um, who, who was both very concise but very thorough, all, all in one go? It looks like you're off the hook, Charlie. Just to say, okay. though, Chair, I will. Yeah. Know, we will be bringing back regular updates on all the work of the culture producer and the initiatives that are coming through at the ACE Forum. So I think we touched on that in the last uh, ACE Forum meeting about um, the role of the forum to be able to receive reports and updates and to obviously to have oversight on that work. So there'll be plenty of opportunity uh, over the coming months and years for uh, ACE Forum members to, to get actively involved in discussions around the work uh, of the cultural strategy and the work of the cultural producer. Brilliant. We do now have a question from Councillor Moulding. You're not off the hook. Andrew. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chair. And thank you, Charlie, again, for a very good uh, report. Uh, and I was interested in some of the um, potential grant applications that might be available. Did you say you would be able to circulate the information on that to us all? Because I'm sure that would be very useful. Yeah, certainly will do, Andrew. It's been worked on by the economic development team, Tom Winters and Andy Wood. 
So I know they're just going through at the moment um, and also talking with sort of county colleagues as well about, you know, how it can benefit um, East Devon. So absolutely, we'll get that information out um, as soon as possible. I'm sure it will go out as a uh, an all councillor circular as well, but I'll just check with Tom and, and let you know separately, Andrew. Excellent. Thanks for that, Charlie. And thanks for the question, and, uh, Andrew. Right. Um, so I think that brings our meeting to an end. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, for, for their presentations and everybody who's um, who's, who, who's engaged with the, with the meeting um, and any members of the public for their attendance. Members, can I remind you until the Democratic Services team confirm that the live streaming recording is stopped? You may still be seen and heard and any comments may be recorded. <laughs>